All right, Precious. Uh, tough one to talk about this week. It's hard to do a series called Enemies of the State of Marriage and feel like you need to include the church mm. and Christian ministries within that discussion, but yet here we are feeling like we need to do that, right? Totally. Yeah, there's there's a lot of people who within Christian organizations get it wrong, and we wanted to talk about that. Right, and, and a lot of them well-meaning, uh, right? But w- yep. what we want to do today is identify, hey, here's where churches and Christian ministries get it wrong. And there's really two areas they get it wrong. We're going to talk about both and help you understand how do I identify if my church or an organization that I follow that's a Christian organization is missing it with regards to marriage. So let's get into that right now. Before we get into today's episode, just wanted to remind you that in the description of the video below, we put links to all of our social media accounts. You can always reach us with questions or comments about this episode at marriagebydesignpodcast at gmail.com. And finally, if you want to support us financially, there is a link to be able to do so at the end of each of the descriptions of our videos. Now, let's get back to the show. Hi, everybody. I'm Nathan Warnock. I'm Andrea Warnock, and you've joined us for Marriage Monday on the Marriage by Design podcast. This is a time that we get to talk to you about God's design for marriage, what the Bible has to say about that, and how we live that out practically. I almost forgot that thing. I had like a. It's only been four years. Right. I had like a little blip in the in the brain. (laughs) Happens. It happens. So I, if you're watching, uh, which by the way, if you sometimes like to do video and sometimes you like to do audio, go to our website marriagebydesign.podbean.com and we're working on uh, decomplicating that uh, web address but uh, it's marriagebydesign.podbean.com and you can pick uh, if you want to do video or audio you can switch back and forth but if you are watching the video today I am joining you I I, I was just looking in our feed as Will Smith I think with my flappy ears I got flappy ears you feel like you have flappy ears in this hat I feel like oh it's the hat I feel like I got Flappy oh, wow. ears going today. Speaking of flappy ears. Don't be ears, self-conscious about that. I that's think right. Your ears uh, look great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, all right. So d- we are in the midst of a part two of a series called Enemies of the State of Marriage. Uh, last week, we talked about Hollywood as an enemy of the state of marriage. So love to have you go back and check it out. I'll make sure to link to that in this video. All forms of Hollywood. I mean, not all, all Hollywood, but... Right, but a lot many of... many different forms. Yeah, a lot of... I mean, yeah, you're saying like books or music right. or movies or t- television shows. They all can they all can fall into this. So love to have totally. you go back and check that out. But today we want to talk about another one that uh, we struggle with quite a bit um, and that we need to, t- to tread carefully in this episode because we are talking about the church and Christian organizations as enemies of the state of marriage. But I want to start this off by being really clear about something. The church, what? I said, uh, no, let, 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 let me, me be clear. Let, let me be clear. <laughs> let me, let me, let me, let me be clear. Uh, the church is the bride of Christ. Yeah. Right. The Bible is clear about that. Uh, so uh, we want to be really careful. You know, I tell my kids and this sometimes they treat you poorly. And what do I tell them? Oh, they treat me poorly? Yeah. Oh, don't treat my wife that way. Right. That's my girlfriend. Or my girlfriend. Right? That's yeah. my wife. That's yeah. my woman. Like, you you treat her that way. There's going to be consequences for you for doing that. And so sometimes when I'm critical of the church, I want to start by just recognizing her as the bride of Christ. Yeah. Uh, and be respectful in this conversation. But also, um, I want to say, and I, I have never been a bride. I have been around uh at least one bride, but babe, tell me like if you were the bride and you had like toilet paper sticking out from under your dress and your bridesmaids let you do your wedding and then you saw it and you were obviously aghast and they went, Oh yeah, we saw that. Mm -hmm. We just didn't, we felt embarrassed because you're the bride and we didn't really want to call you out on that. How would you feel about those friends? Uh, like they totally betrayed me in that moment. Yeah, exactly. Cause they let you look like a fool. Right. I, that's, that's how I feel about this issue and to be clear the bride of christ is not 
the church as far as a certain church organization or denomination. That, that's right. Or whatever. It, it's the people who have believed that Jesus Christ yep. is, you know, has died for their sins, that he, <clears throat> excuse me, was died and, re- and resurrected. Right. That he's, he, he's the Lord of their life. Yeah, the community and, of believers in right, whatever so that form could be, that community that could be takes. Some people at in a certain denomination and some that are not. You know, exactly it's, right. It's the That's right. yeah the the church is the our way of saying people who have been saved. Yeah, that's that's a good that's a good point, babe. Thanks for thanks for being clear on that. So <clears throat> here we are, looking at trying to figure out how do we address a, a the toilet paper sticking out of the dress of the bride of Christ. Yeah, there's. Because it needs to be addressed. That's right. But there's a respectful way to do it. That's right. That's right. So we're coming into this that way. So if you stumbled across this video and you went, yeah, I hate the get church. Em. Let's <laughs> get them. Uh, you need to work on that between you and the Lord. Well, and you might um, be a little bummed. Because, right, because that's not, that, it's not appropriate. Uh, and I r- really don't want God coming to me and going, Jesus, coming to me and going, that's my bride. You better knock it off. Um Instead, I want to approach this with some humility, but some ferocity, um, because Jesus, the one time we see him really get heated uh, in the Bible mm-hmm. is when people, p- humans, took the temple, the place Holy of worship things. of God, and trivialized them by making them a marketplace. Right. Um, and so there is a sense in which I believe the church has trivialized something sacred to the Lord in marriage and it needs to stop. And to the extent that we can impact that, and I don't mean we, Andrea and I, although we do the best we can when we see it, but I mean the marriage by design community, those in marriage at large, uh, those you can share this video. Like we need a whole group of people that are championing marriage and on the hunt for places where the church is trivializing or not understanding something that is clearly sacred to the Lord uh, in marriage. Yeah. So let's get into that. What does that look like? Right. So there's really two avenues we want to explore in this video that are large areas and we could spend a lot of time on how we see these play out. But the two areas we find church and, and Christian organizations miss the boat is in either trivializing marriage by not knowing God's design for marriage at all, right? There's sort of like, there's God stuff. There's the stuff Jesus did in the gospels. There's Moses and Noah and that. And then there is marriage sort of over here in the secular world, right? We get married, we have married. Like it's not, yes, marriage is in the Bible, but it's not really a focal point. Mm. So I, I, we call those, those that do not know. The uninformed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then there's a second group, the more insidious group who know and have twisted God's design for marriage for their own gain. And, uh, we will address those groups specifically. And really, believe it or not, that <clears throat> is the battleground that is being waged denominationally right now. Mm. Um, at, in, in every denomination, certainly the United Methodists have given over to this long ago, you know, in the last decade. Uh, but uh, Pope Benedict is leading the Roman Catholic Church in a dire direction right now in this same regard. So we'll talk about that group second. We call that group those that do not care. Hmm. So we've got those that do not know and those that do not care. Um, First and foremost, we ought to just be clear in case this is the first time you've watched our channel. uh, We believe God had a design for marriage. There was a design from the beginning. We see that in Matthew 19. Jesus says from the beginning when he talks to about marriage. And that means from the beginning, beginning, like in the Uh, beginning, right. right? From Genesis one, there was a plan. And, We don't even get through the second chapter of Genesis before God unveils that plan for marriage, before even the fall of man. So at this point, death had not entered the world. Yeah, we're living in perfection. Right, and yet part of that perfect design... Is marriage. Is marriage. And so when we look at that and we go, man, 
God looked down and saw Adam alone and said, this is not good, right? This is not perfect. It's the first time that God said something wasn't good on earth. Yeah, so, and, so the account is he had just created all things. Yep. And then God looks down and says, oh, well, this is not good. Right. Uh, you know, and he had said, all these things are great, are good. Uh, perfect. Been, yeah. yeah. Had, yep. Yep. That have been created. And then That's he right. looks down and says, oh, but this is not good that right. man is alone. There's There's no one like him. There's no equal match with him. Right. And yet being made in God's image, we weren't really the completed image of God because God is the Trinity, right? Three in one, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, who were all there in creation. We see that. And again, you can go look at Genesis 2 if you want to read this for yourself. But uh, God says this is not good. And so how does he make it good? How does he make it perfect? He says, I will create for Adam a helper, Eve who comes from Adam, God presents Eve to Adam. Adam is thrilled and God says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So that was the first marriage ceremony. Right. That's how Genesis 2 ends. That's right. That's right. Genesis 2 ends with an arranged marriage. Um, And then we see in Matthew 19, Jesus reaffirms that. We see in Mark, that story told again. We see Paul uh, in Ephesians, in Corinthians, uh, in um, uh, then Peter in 1 Peter. We We see this sort of the sacred a reality of marriage refreshed again and again by authors throughout the Bible under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So for us, it's not hard for us to say God had a clear design for marriage. Marriage was created by him. Therefore, as his creation, he gets to define the design. And we don't get to change that. Yeah, and he keeps reaffirming that in the New Testament. That's right. The, The logic of this is God is greater than you and I. Therefore, the things that God has created, we don't get to modify because he's greater than we are, right? So we don't get to redefine marriage on our terms because we didn't design it. Someone greater than us designed it. Instead, we're asked to shepherd that relationship in our own marriages as well as in the marriages of those in our gospel communities, churches, etc. So here's how this is unfortunately developed since almost the beginning of the church as a thing, and probably, not probably, definitely before that, because you go back to the Old Testament, and there were a lot of marriages that were not according to God's design, and I would, for the most part, put those in the those that did not know camp, Hmm. Uh, probably, Hmm. right? Would you disagree with that? You think David and Abraham and all those guys, you think they knew having multiple wives was... Not according. I don't know. To God's that's design. hard. It's hard because it was a totally different time. There weren't, there weren't the scriptures like we have them today. Right. That'd be know. an interesting debate to to have. But point is, God never blesses polygamy throughout, uh, th- throughout, um, the the Old Testament. We're gonna kind of talk about Polyamory that specifically. Yeah. We've talked about it a little bit last week. We're gonna talk about it specifically next week. Uh, but God never blesses that. Uh, and it almost always ends in tragedy. Disaster. See Solomon. See David. Abraham. See David. Uh, it's a it's a mess when you start trying to have something other than God's design. So here's the two groups we're going to talk about. We're going to take those that do not know first. And I want to say this to start off. I want to encourage you, if you're listening to this, with a verse from Second Timothy. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You know which one it is, babe? What does it say? Do you remember? All scripture. Is God breathed and is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. So the, that the man of, the man God, of God may be can, fully equipped mm-hmm. for every, every good, good work. work. Yep. I, I want to say this carefully, but I want to say it boldly. You simply cannot have a Christian organization if you do not understand what the word of God says and how it ought be applied to circumstances surrounding us, right? And an application, uh, I believe that the word of God is to be taken literally. I believe that there is one interpretation to the word of God, um, that it involved real people in real places in real time, uh, but that all scripture was inspired by the Holy Spirit and then given to men who wrote it down, I believe perfectly, and that 
although there's one interpretation, the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God in different ways in our lives. It's one of the most incredible things. It's why we can dedicate our lives to reading through the Bible multiple times, and the Bible seems like a fresh wellspring. It seems fresh and new each time, because I'm different right. each time I yeah, read it. Yeah, there's one interpretation, but the application can change based on who's reading it and the that's right. point of life they're in. That's right. That, that's what I believe. Um, and I think you could say that's what you believe. Right. So, <laughs> so, uh, so we're at least mostly in agreement on, on that point. So h- here's the point of when we say those that do not know, there's tragically a considerable number of church leaders, dare I say, pastors, uh, elders, deacons, um, a number of, of those types of individuals who are looked at as spiritual leaders in churches and Christian organizations that simply do not know what the word of God says. Would you agree with that? Oh, maybe in some circumstances. Okay. So what, yeah, how I mean, would you modify that then? Yeah, I, I would say they don't know. Or they they either just flat don't know, or they don't know the depths of what that means. Yeah, I think there. Yeah, I think there's probably both of those. I mean, I, I can give it, and this is totally anecdotal, but uh, you know, I, I, I so I, my day job is that I'm a, a salesperson for a cleaning commercial cleaning company, and I went to a church and met with a deacon in that church, and we walked into the sanctuary. It's a beautiful sanctuary, but the top of it sort of looked like a boat that had been turned upside down. Uh, and in fact, he didn't know this, but I know this, uh, that was to honor, this was an Episcopal church, when when the pilgrims really first started coming over here, immigrating, they didn't have like all the wood and all that initially to build these kinds of things. And of course the first thing many of them wanted to build in these settlements was a church. Right. Because that's largely why they came here. Right. And so oftentimes what they would do, I mean, they didn't need the ship anymore, right? Because they are here now. They would use the boat turned upright uh, upside down as the roof of these church buildings. And so this church in a city, uh, spoiler, not near the coast, <laughs> uh, had, but they had done this as like a recognition of that. And he goes, he's talking to me and he goes, uh, yeah, so uh, I guess the roof is meant to look something like a boat or something because I guess that there's like a story in the Bible that involves someone building a boat or something. I don't, I'm, I don't really read the hey, Bible. That's a, that's an exact quote, including the, I don't know, I don't really read the Bible. That, that was, was that's an exact sure quote. Being... I mean, okay. So even beside <laughs> that, that crazy to even me. beside I've that, never is heard that, that story something before. you think is appropriate? No, no, I've just never someone... heard that story before. Yeah, that's what he said. That and I and I kind of looked at him, and in my mind, I'm going. Did you say he was the pastor of the church. He's a deacon, a deacon. of of the church, uh, a, a deacon right, of the church. Right, right. But he's you know he was a he's probably seventy. Yes. I mean you know probably and, even and he told me life. he'd been in this church his whole life. And I thought how how do you I mean. My three-year-old knows Noah and that Noah built an ark, right? I mean, that's like one of the very first Sunday school stories you learn. But I'm sure, like a lot of people, he goes to church communally and socially and does not go for spiritual growth. And that's exactly the problem, right? Right, Because there are a lot of people in churches who are married or considering marriage and want sound biblical advice into their marriage. And so who do you go talk to? Deacons, pastors, pastors, church leaders. These are the folks that you talk to. And if, as is often, not, I wouldn't say mostly, I wouldn't say 50-50, but way more than it ought to, uh, they don't know, right? It's crazy to me to think that there's people, and there's a lot of them, I know that, but that are following something that they don't even know what it is. It's incredible. And that's not just in the Christian religion, of course. It's right. in a lot of different things. But how 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 can you follow something that you don't even know what you're following? Right. And right. That, and it's uh, has to do with your eternity. Right. I can share another uh, just brief example. A, a guy came to my Bible study, and he this guy and his wife uh, had re- complete restoration in their marriage. They now have a uh, influencer channel for, for marriage. But when he f- very first came to his senses and thought, I got to get my marriage right. He came to my Bible study 
on a Wednesday morning. And he shared a story of him talking with the church of his hometown, like his hometown Lutheran church. It's a pastor. And he shared the story and asked the pastor, what should I do? And this pastor told him, you know, sometimes things get so bad that you just have to, you just have to cut bait and start over. What? Mm. Says who? Yeah. Like after he, this guy shared this with me, I, I honestly considered asking him if I could get that guy's phone number and calling him and saying, what I hope you, you never talk to another married couple but again. But I think that ever. guy would probably be put in this second category. Not the first. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, I think there are a lot of people that genuinely think divorce is like, it's an okay thing, right? I, I mean, know. It's, you know, it's just when things get bad, like God will understand, right? God loves you, right? He'll understand if you just, you know, you got to move on, right? I mean, sometimes it's you just got to move on. It's the thought of maybe this isn't, maybe the Bible has to say something about this, but, but God will forgive this, right? Right. Like, oh, what Paul talks about, should I, should we sin so that grace may abound all the more? No. Right. Yeah, that's the, you're you're right, and, and and probably, you know, maybe that goes into the those who don't know slash or are too lazy to look it up. Don't care, mm-hmm. right? I mean, yeah. I, yeah, like they don't. It's not that they know and they don't care. It's that they go. You said it. Yeah, the Bible probably talks about this. But if but I it's don't like know, can book. I can I claim, you know, ignorance it doesn't, of ignorance. the law. Right. The ignorance of the yeah. law is no excuse. That was the word I was for. That's right. Okay. No, so right. what's the second right. category then? Okay. So uh, the second cat. Well, let's wrap up the first category okay. first. So here's how you suss this out with the organizations you follow. I want you to find a pastor, find some church leaders. If your church has a marriage ministry, figure out, find out who leads that, and I want you to go to them, and I want you to say this this exact thing. If I wanted to learn more about God's design for marriage, where would I go in the Bible to find that? I'm going to, I'm going to say it again in case you were writing it down. And I'm, I I want you to say this exact thing to them. If I wanted to learn more about God's design for marriage, where would I go in the Bible to find that? And listen to what they say. If they say our church has a podcast you should listen to Marriage by Design. Uh, we have a love and respect study that meets on Thursday nights. If they say any of that, you just smile and walk away. And maybe think about walking away away from, uh, from that, that organization church. or church. Uh, these people don't know what the Bible says about marriage. And at the very least, if you go, well, hey, I love the church for a lot of other reasons. If you ever need marital advice, do not go to those leaders for that because you're going to get what Craig Groeschel thinks about marriage or Stephen Furtick or the Pope or whomever else, right? And, and you need to go the source. Praise the Lord. God gave us the Bible. We can go right to the source. So if they're not telling you, go here, 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 here in the Bible, and even better, let's get together. I'd love to talk you through those so that we're clear about what the design for marriage is. That's a problem, right? That at least individual, if not organization, falls into the they don't know category. Okay, now let's move to the they don't care. Uh, And this takes a little bit less time because frankly, uh, far as I'm concerned, this gets to be a little bit of Jesus lashing people in the temple, and I don't want to start throwing stuff. Um, <clears throat> marriage is under significant attack mm. in this country, and it's under attack because marriage is designed to be a picture of God's desired relationship with us as his people. So if Satan can screw that up, he's created a twisted picture of God's design that for doesn't marriage. doesn't point people to Christ. But Satan's not happy enough with that. Go back and look at what Satan's temptation of Jesus in the wilderness looked like. Satan quoted the Bible. And he quoted the Bible 90% accurately. Right. It was 
yeah, it was twisted just a little bit. It sounded probably right. Right. But twisted just a little so that it served what Satan wanted to say. That's right. And Satan's been twisting marriage and family amongst us humans since the beginning of time. Sure. Right. But but we see it in droves in this country. But here's what I want to get to with the temptation in the wilderness. The last temptation Jesus underwent was Satan just telling him, hey, bow down to me and I'll give you all of this. Right. Like, I'll give you this as your kingdom. Satan would have been thrilled to hold Jesus out as the king. Right? Is Jesus the king? Of course. Is he the king of earth? No. No. That's the lie. Right? Satan's whole... This is what Satan's doing now. Right? He's He takes a God thing, holds it out as a God thing, but the twisted version of it. Yep. Right? So it's not enough to twist it to hurt people. He wants to twist it, but then convince you it's a holy thing because then he gets people to start buying into this. Well, this is a God thing. My church says this, this is the right thing to do. And they jump into it thinking it's a God thing. And you know what the net result of that is? Matthew 7, 23 makes it clear. You get to the other side. Jesus talks to those people and says, hey, um, what's up with you? And they go, Lord, Lord. I did all of these things in, in your, your name. name. I stood up for LGBTQ plus 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 IACPW relationships through my church, United Methodist, looking at you. And uh, my pastor said this was a God honoring thing because, because love was, is because love. This is loving. Right. right? And so I, I did these things. And sadly, and I'm sure through tears, Matthew 7, 23 says God's going to look at them and he's going to say, I'm sorry, I never knew you. Now depart from me, you doers of iniquity. And I think there are people that are going to unknowingly go to hell, eternal separation from God. And the reason that they're going to go is because they attended a church that knew the truth and didn't care. And this is one aspect where churches are falling into this. Churches are, the, the Bible is crystal clear about what marriage is designed to be. The only way that you can take what the Bible says about marriage and twist it around is if you intentionally and knowingly change the meaning of common words. And typically that's done by saying, well, you know, historically, well, you know. In the Hebrew or in the Greek, well, you know, when you take it in the context of, you know, uh, this thing over here, it's not taking the literal understanding of the Bible. It's twisting it and it's twisting it for an agenda. And here's the agenda, specifically with this idea that marriage was not designed to be between a man and a woman exclusively for the entirety of their natural lives. It says it in the Bible, it says it in the Old Testament, it says it in the New Testament. It's crystal clear. But there's a lie going around that if churches will soften up on this LGBTQ plus issue, those individuals are just looking for a church they want to be a part of that will accept them. And churches are in droves changing their theology in an effort to soften those up at the, at the best, completely change them at the worst, in order to convince this community that this church is cool for them to come to. And you know what the result of that is? Maybe not in your specific church, but globally in churches that have done this, like the, UM, like the UMC, uh, <laughs> those that want doctrine, that want Bible theology, they've left rightfully, and thank you for doing that, as hard as it may have been if you've done that. Thank you for standing up for what's right. They're leaving, and guess who's not showing up? The LGBT++ community. But they are. I mean, they are some. Right. But, but they're showing up for a watered-down version of the gospel that's not truth, and they're being tricked into believing that they have something, eternal salvation, that they don't. Right. Uh, because it's not our actions that save us, right? It's not that you are gay or you aren't gay or you accept the gay agenda or you don't or whatever. It's not that that's what's going to give us salvation or not. It's 
a heart attitude towards the Lord. Yep. And if our heart attitude, if our, if our belief is I can be the God of my life, my own life, I can, I can pick and choose from the Bible what is right and wrong. That's putting yourself as, as your own salvation and you've missed the mark. That's right. And maybe brought a whole bunch of people along with you. That's right. And that's the saddest thing is yep. that there's people who are all over the globe being tricked into believing that God is a, that that God is for something that he's not and they believe a false gospel. Yep. That's right. Yeah, that's right. It's 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 incredibly sad. Um so I mean we could go on and on. And it's uh, not just the like it's not just the LGBTQ no, it's not. plus stuff. It's, oh, yeah, you know what? God doesn't need you to repent of this, which repent means turn, turn away, away mm-hmm. and walk towards yep. the righteousness. Yep. He doesn't need you to repent of this affair. You just need to divorce your wife so that you guys can be happy. And then it'll be cool for you to stay with this other woman that you're happier with. That's, that's right. putting your happiness above the Lord. That's right. That's putting your agenda above the Lord. Yeah. And it's, so it it's, not it's not just biblical. It's not God one honoring. thing. It's, it's anything that's, that isn't one man, one woman married for the entirety of their natural lives. Anything that goes against that is, is not what the Bible is telling us. And then it comes into question of, well, what are you following? Are you following the God of the Bible? I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that you are. Right. W- with regards to saying the, that that's God's best for people's lives, right? We, we've talked on this channel and there's videos about portions of the Bible that indicate that there are ways in which you can. There are. There are a, a couple reasons but for there, biblical divorce. Right, right. But it's not God's best for your marriage. Right. Clearly. And I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying that your actions are what save or don't save you. That's right. So if you wrongfully got a divorce or are doing things that you shouldn't that's not what saves you or not it's just a question of submission have you submitted to your life to the real god right <laughs> you know right. right um or have you that's submitted right. your life to something that's not real right T- it's it, have I, you submitted your life you. to say to to the enemy who's twisted 10% of the word yeah. so that you don't actually believe what you think, you know, what you thought you were believing. In. Right. Anyway. Right. So yeah, that, that's good. It's teaching on divorce. It's teaching on what marriage is. It's teaching on sex. It's, 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 t- it's all of those things. It's not any one, you know, specific thing. Yep. It's just, we're seeing a lot of the, the yeah. sort of modern wokeness going on within the church. And it's, it's devastating because departure did, from the scripture. We did marriage ministry at a church for years that, was so on fire for yep. we believe what the Bible has to say about marriage period. Yep. Yep. And they hold held true to that. And, and that was, that was so refreshing oh, it, Yeah, to be a part of that. And for us to really understand, ha- have a better understanding of what it looks like to love people in truth. Right. And, um, the truth can be hard, but it's the most loving thing. Um, to give people the truth. Yeah, that's that's right. So with regards to those that don't care, here, here's the solution to that. You need to know what the Bible says about marriage, right? It, it, we can't be reliant on other people to just tell us. And I'm telling you this as someone who is part of a Christian organization. I'm telling you and have told you, I mean, how many times have we said this in videos? Don't just take what we say yeah. and walk away with it. For sure. Get that's why we try to give you biblical references so you can go back and look. And if you think we're wrong, tell us we're wrong. You better go back to the Bible because if it's I've had some people that have posted comments of like, well, the Holy Spirit told me, you know, that you guys are off. Well, where does it say that in the Bible? Because because we want to have a good discussion. About yeah, that when then. the Holy Spirit's not schizophrenic. So the Holy Spirit said it in the Bible. He inspired people to write down what's in the Bible. He's not going to change his mind. So feel free to tell me where I'm wrong in the Bible, but don't just give me this, you know, an angel told me you guys are idiots. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, uh, but but you got to know, right? You have to know mm-hmm. what, the, what the Bible says because you need to identify when a pastor or someone uh, you look up to in an organization is missing the mark. And I would encourage you, 
under the power of the Holy Spirit, walk in the boldness to confront them when they are wrong. Because maybe in reality, they're not those that don't care. They're just those that don't know. And if you bring correction to them humbly um, in an effort to help them understand, hey, marriage is important and I think you're off base here. Can I, can I share with you what I, what I believe? Then two things are going to happen. One, you might help them to keep them from misleading people. And two, you might realize they're actually someone that doesn't care. Mm-hmm. And then you should leave. Um, so anyway, that's, that's that. Those that don't know, those that don't care. Uh, those are the two ways that the church and Christian organizations can become enemies of the state Let's of marriage. Let's make sure we're people who do know and do care. That's exactly right. Guys, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate you being here. If you have an opportunity, please check out our website, marriagebydesign.podbean.com. Uh, leave a comment there. If you have comments, you can leave a comment on YouTube or uh, Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to this uh, to this podcast. Thanks, guys, so much for joining us. Appreciate you being here. Uh, and remember, God is for your marriage. Have a great week.